You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Until all my fears are gone Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God My mother's who you have chosen me, your love has called my name, and I've been born again to a family, and your blood flows through my veins, cause I'm no longer a slave to be. child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God
Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine such grace of mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory.
Well, good morning, church. My name is Ramon. I'm one of the pastors here at Nags Head Church. Thanks so much for joining us uh, online. And I'm um, just excited to continue our series here as we're talking about the good kings and the bad kings of Israel's history. And um, as if you've been uh, with us these past few weeks, you know that, man, there's been a lot of ups and downs within the nation of Israel and and splitting into two different nations. So it's just been uh, really a roller coaster of uh, some poor choices between kings. And unfortunately, the uh, king that we're going to be looking at today, King Ahaziah, um, was one of those bad kings. So, But before we get started, I want to go ahead and pray and uh, just allow the Holy Spirit to really just kind of clear our minds and ready our hearts for what God has for us this morning. God, we thank you so much for this time together in your word. Lord, as we're going to be looking at uh, this story that you've included uh, in your word, God, your love letter to us, uh, because it's important, God, because you want us to learn something from this, because you want us to be able to take what we can from this and and uh, not only grow from it, but help other people grow from it as well as we're encouraged by it so we, that we can encourage others. Uh, thank you for this time again, Lord. I pray right now that your Holy Spirit uh, would be working through me to speak what it is you want me to say, and uh, for those that would be listening, uh, God, that you may uh, also, uh, put any distractions out of the way, Lord, so that they can focus on uh, this particular message, God, and see what you'll do with this in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So I'm going to be continuing. Uh, we're going to be actually in 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. So we're going to be looking at the life of Ahaziah, son of Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, so if you've heard the previous stories of, about Ahab, not such a good king, made some really poor choices. So uh, to begin with, the, my opening question for all of us, and it's a very important question, and really has to do a lot with this story on how much we are trusting God. Do we really believe in the power of prayer or not so much? I mean, we claim to believe that prayer works, am I right? We claim that as a church, and here at Nagstead Church, man, we are, we are a church that prays and believes that God will come through uh, according to His will. Whether that answer is yes or no, or you need to wait a little bit longer because I'm working through this situation, uh, we believe in the power of prayer. And prayer changes things. Prayer has that power. But do we really truly believe that in the midst of our turmoil, in the midst of our uh, situation that we might be uh, dealing with or facing, do we really truly believe, God, are you really listening? So let's think about it this way. Think about it another way. Am I trusting in God first in every aspect of my life, or do I first go to others for advice or maybe other things before I seek God? Think about it that way. Maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe you're like, you're not, your first impulse isn't to go to prayer um, because we're human beings. Really, uh, 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 what we want to do is figure it out on our own because we don't go to God right away. When we're born, we're, we are against God. We don't seek after God. God seeks after us. And so as it's a natural, human, sinful way for us to be like, you know what, I'm going to figure this out on my own. I'm going to get all the answers from somebody else um, and not go to God with it uh, first. And as for Christians, uh, it's really kind of a difficult uh, thing because, you know, we, we, we want to go to God first, but we don't always. And so this story is going to kind of help us and see what happens when we choose not to. Uh, for an example, let's say someone's going through a tough time, and you can probably think of about uh, a time, and it might be now as we're in the middle of this COVID crisis, uh, you know, with financial loss and all kinds of things. And let's say you have a conversation with somebody, or maybe they've had this conversation with you. And they, the, the question is, is there anything I can do for you? Can I do something for you? And the person says, there's nothing that you can really do, but thanks anyways for asking me. Um, and so our response a lot of the times, and I've been guilty of this myself, is, uh, well, I guess I, 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 at least I can do is pray for you. But then it kind of leaves us to answer this question. It prompts another question in, our, in my life. Is it really the least that we can do for a person or is it the most that we can do for them? I mean, to, to be able to say, well, at least I can do is pray for you. Man, it's almost like when I thought about that, it's like, oh gosh, it's like, it's like me saying, well, prayer is not that big of a deal. Prayer is not going to really solve anything. Prayer doesn't quite actually work. That's the least thing I can do for you. 
But man, really, God's like, that's the most you can do for somebody. You can pray for them. You can, you can uh, call out to me. You have that ability. Those of you who are a believer in Jesus, Jesus made that possible by dying on the cross for us, took our sins away. His blood paid for our sin. He, he resurrected. He tore the veil between us and God so that we can have that direct connection to God the Father, to approach His throne boldly and intercede for people. Man, so we can pray for people. That's the most we can do, which is an exciting thing. So we've seen so far throughout the weeks of these different kings, ones who have trusted God, they've turned to Him, and then we've seen kings that have turned away from God. And that's what we have in this story with Ahaziah. Uh, He did not go seeking after God. In fact, he would seek a false god instead for his answers. So let's start in 2 Kings. We're going to be in chapter 1. I'm going to read the first six verses. So here's what it says. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice window of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers instructing them, Go inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, if I will recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said, to Elijah the Tishbite, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is it because there's no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, you will not get up from your sickbed, you will certainly die. And then Elijah left and the messengers returned to the king who asked them, why have you come back? And they replied, a man came to meet us and said, go back to the king who sent you and declared to him, this is what the Lord says, it is because there is no God in Israel that you're sending these men to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore, you will not get up from your sickbed and you will certainly die. So, uh, obviously we have a couple of issues here. And remember that, that when God was instructing his people, there was something that God had warned him about uh, all these different things. You know, choosing uh, to go to false gods and to stay away from them. Like in Exodus, we have uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. God was very clear and he said, you shall have no other gods before me. And then in Leviticus, he said the same thing. He said, don't turn to mediums or seek, or seek spiritists uh, for they will, they will, you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. This is what he told them. Uh, and then in Leviticus chapter 20. Uh, In verse 6, he says this to them. He says, I set my face against the person who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute himself by following them. I will cut him off from his people. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty serious. God takes it very seriously. God is a jealous God. Man, he loves us so much. He wants our undivided attention. So for, for God to warn us in such a way, warn his chosen people, to stay away from these things. It was very serious. It was actually, um, p- the penalty was death to uh, be involved in, in idol worship. And so yet, here is King Ahaziah. He ignores all these things, ignores these warnings, uh, sent, sends messengers to consult with, these, with this false god, Baal, which his father before him, again, Um, that was his thing. He actually set these things up, this worship of Baal. So when the Lord saw that the the ruler of this land is so blatantly blatantly defying him, uh, he warns him, he sends Elijah to to give him this warning. And here in verse 7 through 8, here's what it says. The king asked them, "What what sort of man came up to you and spoke those words to you? Uh, They replied, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. He said, it's Elijah, the Tishbite. So obviously, uh, here King Ahaziah knows who this is, and uh, he's no stranger to him. I mean, this was, Elijah's very popular. He is the one who uh, called fire down uh, to, to prove that the God of Israel is the one true God in the face of Baal, who his uh, worshipers could do nothing when they called out for him. So here the king realizes that it's Elijah who was giving, who's, who's given this deadly message. And I think it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, here Elijah's upset about it. And yet he's the one that said to these messengers, you know, go find out what's going on. And like, you know, go ask, go, go inquire of this. 
And he gets mad because he gets the answer that he doesn't like. I mean, he wants to know what his future is about. And uh, he sent these messengers to Ekron to consult Baal. And here's the difference. You see, God is going to do his will regardless. And God will do, uh, will, will do what he can to turn his children back to him. Whereas the, the Baal worshipers or any false idol, uh, that you can manipulate those gods to do what you want, to get the answers that you want. You can manipulate their, their uh, 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 messengers, you know, for them to just tell the king whatever he wants to hear. And so that's what uh, was going on here. And Elijah got pretty upset about it. And, uh, but he was hoping to intimidate Elijah, Ahaziah was. He was hoping to intimidate him. So here's what he did. Let's go to verses 9 through 12 here. So King Ahaziah sent a captain of 50 with his 50 men to Elijah. When the captain went up to him, he was sitting on top of the hill, and he announced, Man of God, the king declares, come down. Elijah responded to the captain of the 50, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your men. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So the king sent another captain of 50 with his 50 men to Elijah, and he took in the situation and announced, Man of God, this is what the king says. Come down immediately. Elijah responded, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. So a divine fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Now this is not uh, something that Elijah hasn't done before, as I mentioned Earlier, and if you were here with our previous weeks, you know that this is something Elijah has done before. Uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God has done this. So if you can imagine uh, being this, the third captain that comes along, and he's going to inquire of Elijah. So let's continue, because the third captain, he's a lot smarter. He's seen that these two other previous captains have failed. So let's go in to verse 13 and on and see what, it, what happens here. Then the king sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up and fell on his knees. Already he's doing well. Uh, In front of Elijah and he begged him, man of God, please let my life and the lives of those 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Already fire has come down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of 50 with with their 50s. But this time, let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So he got up and he went down with him to the king. So if you can imagine being the third captain, you know, you, you, you've seen what's, what's happened already. Uh, but here's the big difference. Obviously, we see that this captain has humbled himself. He's humbled himself because he realizes this, this man, Elijah, he does speak for God. All right, uh, uh, and God is real, and God is powerful, and uh, I am not going to mess up like these other kings. And so I won't. He, he's like, I'm not going to intimidate Elijah. How can I go against uh, God? You know, it's it's just like when Scripture tells us, uh, "Who can be against us?" Right? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Even if they take away everything of ours, if they can't take away our salvation. They can't take away what what God has graciously given to us and what God has given Elijah. Uh, but but it cannot be taken away. And so uh, this man knows this, that I, how, what am I going to do against God? And uh, there's, a, there's a great question that I want us to be looking at. And I'm going to read the last couple of verses here and, to kind of set this up. So in verse 16, it says this, Then Elijah said to King Ahaziah, this is what the Lord says. So now he's before the king, right? Elijah went with this captain, this captain who humbled himself. And here he is. Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron, is it because there is no god in Israel for you to inquire of his will? And you will not get up from your sickbed. You will certainly die. Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Since he had no son, Joram became king in his place. And this happened in the second year of Judah's king, Joram, son of Jehoshaphat. 
and the rest of the events of Ahaziah's reign, along with his accomplishments, are written about in the historical record of Israel's king. And that's the end of his story. There's not a whole lot about Ahaziah, but I think there's some big lessons we can learn for his short-lived uh, time as a king. But I want you to catch the reoccurring question that happens here. And it's brought up in verse 3 initially. Verse 3 says uh, that, if, that, that there's no God. Is there no God in Israel that you're going to acquire Beelzebub? And then that same question uh, is in verse 6. And then Elijah speaks, to, speaks it to the king in the final verses in verse 16. Is there no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult this false God? And I wonder is I, if I was thinking, and if I was in Ahaziah's place, and even thinking about today, 2020, you know, in my life as a believer now, I wonder if um, maybe this question, if God has asked me this question, you know, if I've been guilty of this as well. God looks at me, God looks at my life, and he says, Ramon, is there no God in your life? Am I not in your life that you've turned to every other thing or every other person except for me? Did you leave me out last? Um, you know, and it's kind of convicting. And I don't know for you, uh, but it's convicting for me because I have done those things. There has been times where I was just like this king. Uh, maybe I didn't fall out of a, of a window or didn't fall off a roof through the lattice or whatever, but... I surely didn't inquire of God right away when things hit, hit home uh, in my life. And uh, does God have, the, have a good reason to ask us that question? Of course he does. Um, and I'll say it again, is it because there is no God in your life that you turn to everything else except for turning to me? Um, some examples that maybe we can think about. Husband and wives, um, is he asking that question of you? Are you tired of arguing, tired of fighting, tired of uh, your, your marriage is falling apart? You feel alone. You feel uh, like you're not loved, like you should be loved. And your marriage is just hanging on by a thread. And so you turn to self-help books, you turn to counselors, and that's not a bad thing. Um, I think it's a very good thing. You, you turn to uh, conferences or you go to retreats, this kind of thing. And the whole time, as we're looking through a list of different things, God is saying, I'm right here. Have you even tried me? Have you turned to me? First, I haven't left you. I've been at your side through the whole time. I've been watching as your marriage has been in trouble. I'm, I'm here for you. Uh, students, uh, speaking to you, young people, man, maybe you're, you're depressed. You're alone. You're, you're, you're uh, trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life, and you have no direction. You don't know what God is going to do with you. You're working hard, and your grades aren't improving. You're working hard at your sport. Uh, and it seems like nothing is working out. Your relationship with your friends are falling apart. And so you begin to the, the, start blaming other people. And, and your life is bad because of the circumstances or whatever it might be. And again, God is asking that same question. Is there no God in your life that you've turned to these other things? You've turned to your, you've turned to your best friend. Uh, instead of turning to me, you're, you're the best friend. The one who's died for you. Um, he was there with you. Talk to me. Pray to me. I'm here to listen to you. And so we struggle on to overcome sin in our life uh, when we have loved ones or, or sick ones or hurting ones, you know, that kind of thing. And we're facing financial hardships. All, and, and you can list them off. We're facing a lot of different things right now in 2020. I don't think I have to tell you what we're going through right now. And it seems like the world is falling apart besides the coronavirus. There's other things going on. Uh, and so we begin to uh, blame other people. And often we forget that here's the God of the universe, right? God is uh, calling out to us. And he's saying, I'm here. I'm the one that can bring you protection. I'm the one that can encourage you. Believers, those of you who have trusted in Jesus as your savior, he gives us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is living within us, all right? And so we get uh, uh, this wonderful relationship with God. And the, the whole time he's like, man, call out to me. Don't call out to these false idols. The false idol of the internet who's, who you think is going to help you. The false idol of, of uh, a self-help book or whatever that might be. Uh, and again, I'm not saying those things are bad, but God is saying who you go to first. 
Uh, God can certainly use those things. There's some many good godly counselors out there. I highly recommend counseling, uh, you know, seminars, those type of things. A good godly Christian friend who can guide you in the right way. But really, God wants to be the first one that we go to. And this is what Ahaziah failed to do. He failed to turn to God, even when uh, he, he had the opportunity to humble himself. Here, Elijah says, you're going to be, you're going to die. You're not going to leave your sick bed. Your injury is, is so bad that you are going to die. And Ahaziah should have said, God, is there anything I can do? I'm, cry, I'm crying out to you. I need your help. I'm sorry I've sinned against you. But instead, he goes, you know what? I'm going to go ask Baal because the truth is now, and this is a human thing, the truth is we'd rather have it our way than how God has set it for us. And that's just us being human beings, sinful human beings. We'd rather try and figure out uh, what's the best way that that works out for me? How can I manipulate this situation so that it's good for me? Or that may not be God's will. And that's the big fear, is that God's going to ask us to do something that we don't want to do. Uh, uh, and so that's what Ahaziah does. I'm just going to ask Baal, because I know I can kind of work that a little bit and manipulate that and get the answer that I want. And despite of all this, Here's, here's the, the, the big picture of all this. Uh, we have this great God who loves us, who left his throne, uh, became a man named Jesus, lived a perfect life. Not only that, but he died for us. He took our place on the cross. He took all of the sins of the world upon himself. Because he knew you cannot be perfect enough for an infinitely perfect God. So Jesus stepped in and said, I'm going to do that for you. I love you so much that I'm going to die for my creation. My blood will be shed for you. And God accepted that gift. Jesus resurrected three days later, proving that, uh, that it was acceptable to God and that there's nothing else we can do. That's the best part is that we don't have to keep trying to impress God. We have to keep trying to do something to get God's attention. God says, if you've believed in my son Jesus and what he's done for you, you belong to me for eternity. So it's like, do we pick the side that says, you know what, oh, I'm having this issue right now in my life. Let me go ask my friend. Or do we pick God who says, I'm the creator of the universe. I spoke it into existence. I died for you. I can, uh, I have the best for you in for your life, talk to me. I'm here for you, and I will lead you to what, what it is that you need according to my will that will be the best outcome for you. Listen to what Paul says as he wrote to the Thessalonians uh, in chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. He says, uh, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to be joyful all the time. He wants us to be praying continually. If, if you can't remember anything of that verse, remember that. Pray continually. Pray continually in all circumstances. Giving thanks to God in all circumstances, which is a hard thing to do. Can you imagine? God, thank you so much for this coronavirus. Think about that for a moment. God, thank you so much that um, my business is losing money. God, thank you so much that uh, that I've been quarantined and I'm, I might have to homeschool my kids and I'm going to go crazy. Uh, but what is God going to do through all this stuff? That's not really what, our, what we want for our life, right? But God at this moment in time in history saying, this is how it's going to be for right now. Just trust me. Come to me. Don't try and figure it out some other way. God says, just listen and trust me. Pray to me continually. And uh, this, for this is your will right? In Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ Jesus, this is something I want you to be doing. So to close this up, when we think about this story of Ahaziah, you know, and the reoccurring question, is there no God in your life, Ahaziah, that you had to go find this false idol? Am I not present? And you know he knew about God. You know he has seen some pretty miraculous things. Instead of asking uh, that condemning question to me, uh, I would rather God say to me at the end of my life, man, Ramon, you were a, 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 a godly man. You were a good husband, a godly husband, and a father who turned to me first before anything else. You know, maybe that's something that you want God to say uh, to you. I hope so. I hope, man, that's my hope for you, that God says you turn to me before you turn to anything or anyone 
else. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to close this out in uh, prayer, and then after, after this, uh, someone will be up and, and uh, give us just a couple announcements of, of some things that are coming up here at Nags Head Church. God, thank you again for your uh, word that is truth, and thank you, God, for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he came and took our place, that His your wrath turned away from us because of what Jesus has done for us, God, that he died for us, that um, he took our sins away on the cross, that his blood paid for that, God, past, present, and future. God, those sins are gone, and we don't have to uh, do anything, God. We just simply have to believe that, believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, believe that he did die for us, God, that he did resurrect, proving that uh, it was acceptable to you, God, and that's all we have to do. And uh, Lord, and, and just to, um, to, for us to, to, to live in that, to work out our salvation. If there's somebody who's listening to this message now who's never heard that, God, may this be the moment that, you, that your Holy Spirit just works in their heart and says, man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. I didn't know that God loved me so much. I don't have to do anything to earn it. I just have to believe in what the Lord has done for me. Uh, so, uh, God, I thank you again for this time together in your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. God bless you. Hey, I'm Scott. I'm Chloe. And we're from Max Ed Church. We are so glad you're joining us today. If you are interested in learning more about what it means to be a follower of Christ or about the assurance of salvation, we would love if you reached out and contacted us. The easiest way to do that is to go to our website, nagsheadchurch.org, and press the contact button. Or you can also download the Nags Head Church app and contact us through there. You may have a question about something Rick said today, or you may want to know more about Nags Head Church. Please let us know. Some of you may be thinking, how can I support the ministry of Nags Head Church? Well, you have three ways. You can text Nags Head to 77977, or you can go to nagsheadchurch.org Click Give at the top of the homepage, or you can just drop in the mail to us at P.O. Box 302, Nagshead, North Carolina, 27959. Thanks for joining us.